Hi, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. I have to say I loved the book, The Science of Learning and Development, and I'm very excited to be here to offer some uh, reflections and some uh, uh, ideas uh, in response to the book uh, from a Global South perspective. One of the key merits of this book is that it, uh, it accomplishes a major feat, which is it um, manages to summarize and to integrate uh, in a relatively simple and elegant way, massive, massive amounts of knowledge and, and research around how and under what conditions people and children in particular learn best. Um, and that's, that in itself is a, a phenomenal contribution. Uh, the book also includes some comments on equity and implications for equity and practice that are very important, very relevant. In particular, I'm very, uh, very happy to see that um, the authors made, make the point that uh, the science of learning and development has to have an equity lens, that it has to acknowledge and confront institutional systemic racism and oppression. Uh, and that's a, a, breath of his, a, a breath of fresh air uh, for me and for many, for many of us. Um, but let me, let me start then with some reflections um, about, about this book from a Global South perspective. The first thing that I believe this um, book makes clear is that what we believe and know about powerful learning and development and what we do in schools are two very different things. One um, key idea at the center of uh, my work as an educator, as an organizer, as a researcher, as an academic, as a scholar, as a consultant, is that learning is a practice of freedom. And in many ways, the book um, uh, is consistent. The findings in this book are, are consistent with this fundamental idea. Learning is a practice of freedom. And as the book points out as well, especially uh, David and, and, and Pam in their closing chapter, that's not what school is designed to do. Schooling is designed to um, uh, with three uh, major historical functions. One is custody, the other is control, the third one is sorting. This is what schooling knows how to do very well. This is what the institution of schooling knows how to do very well and it's designed to do. But when it comes to learning as a practice of freedom, it does not only, it, it is not only a, 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 an imperfect technology to cultivate it, it gets in the way of it uh, in very in very clear ways. So, what if we are to take the insights from the science of learning and development seriously? We need to think that our schools and school systems will require massive, profound, and widespread cultural change. Nothing less than that. What we need is massive, profound, widespread cultural change, and throughout history the mechanism that humanity has, has found and utilized to change culture in deep and fundamental ways and in a widespread manner, having social movements. So I have argued elsewhere that uh, we need to start thinking about and, pr and practicing educational change as a social movement uh, in the sense that we need to change the culture. And uh, in social movements, we have the vehicle to change culture in deep, widespread and in, in, in a deep and widespread manner. So um, this idea of education of change as a social movement is actually not a, just a theoretical recuperation. There are multiple examples in the global south in particular that have managed to change in fundamental ways the nature of learning and teaching uh, in uh, some of the most remote communities, some of the most historically marginalized communities in their countries, and they have managed to do this at scale. 9,000 schools in the case of Mexico, over 20,000 schools in Colombia with Escuela Nueva, um, about 38,000 schools in the uh, southern state of Tamil Nadu in India with the activity-based learning um, uh, model, and uh, about 2,000 schools uh, in Egypt, the community schools. So tutorial networks in Mexico, Escuela Nueva in Colombia, activity-based learning in India, community schools in Egypt are examples of real social movements that have managed to transform the nature of teaching and learning in very fundamental, very powerful ways, and in ways that are consistent with what we find in, in the book, The Science of Learning and Development. They have managed to do it at scale as well, and they have done it through a me a mechanisms similar to what social movements uh, do. So, um, in many ways, these examples from the Global South, these are just, this is just a handful of them, but there are multiple innovations going on across the Global South that are liberating learning in very powerful ways. And um, what 
what these represent in my view are sanctuaries for learning. They're sanctuaries, they're sp spaces that are maintaining alive the human spirit, the, the, the practices that allow learning and development to flourish, especially in the most historically marginalized communities in the global south. Um, what these movements are doing fundamentally is to replace the grammar of schooling with the language of learning, replacing the grammar of schooling with the language of learning. And that's what we have to do. Uh, the grammar of schooling is this set of rules and, uh, and, and practices and culture that uh, uh, predicate control and, 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 and impose control and sorting and custody. The language of, of learning, on the other hand, is all the practices that um, are consistent with what book uh, de describes about uh, from the science of learning and development, what learning is about, what learning is really about. And if I may use this metaphor of language and grammar, in many ways, what uh, the science of learning and development se seems to be doing is, uh, in relation to the language of learning, is to serve as a linguist. It is the study of the language. That's what the, the science of learning and, de and development has managed to do so far. Now, examining and measuring a phenomenon is not the same as being prepared and ready and able to live it and to make it happen. And that's where I believe there's an important uh, uh, partnership to be established with the Global South and with many other initiatives, not only in the Global South, but also in the North that are already doing phenomenal work around liberating learning. I'm talking about uh, pro initiatives such as big picture learning in, in the United States and across the world. So the schools and networks that are um, yeah, innovating around pedagogy with the new pedagogies for deep learning initiative that Michael Fuller and Joanne Quinn have been have been leading for some years now. Um, but what we what the science of learning and development again has done is to start to decipher what are the core uh, mechanisms and rules of the language of learning. But again, knowing, uh, explaining and understanding something does not conduce immediately to knowing how to produce it or how to create it or how to live it. And again, that's where I believe there's a lot of uh, potential for partnership between those who advance the science of learning and development in the global south. Um, some ideas here to uh, to, to, to stimulate uh, reflection and conversation. I'm hoping, of course, that this is just a first uh, po point of contact, but that, but that we will maintain an ongoing conversation around this important issue of how to bring the science of learning and development to, uh, to the service of liberating learning. Uh, so the first one is um, I invite all of those who, who are advancing the science of learning and development of, to, of engaging and learning about the Global South as learning partners, not as condescending experts, but as learning partners. There's a lot to learn from those who live the language of learning, not necessarily those who explain it, but those who live it, those who are, who are already making it happen. So engage as learning partners. Now, one of the things that the science of learning and development is making clear is that there's really no defensible um, theory behind how schooling operates and what kind of things they're doing to try in the, in the name of learning. It is indefensible. And I think part of the work of the science of learning and development is to contribute to make it, uh, to make it indefensible, to, to make uh, the contradictions of schooling um, very clear and intolerable. At the end of the day, we will not change what we are willing to, to tolerate. And part of our work then as, as, as scientists is to make sure that it becomes intolerable to see and to be part of a culture uh, of schooling that is crashing the imagination, the capacity, the joy for learning in, uh, in hordes and millions, millions of students uh, across the world. Amplify the visibility of power, powerful work already underway. I think that's a, that's a very important thing that uh, those who advance the science of uh, learning and development can do. Help leading practitioners see and understand their practice better. Just offer a mirror and the lens of science of learning and development to understand what, what they're doing better. Uh, help identify some possible blind spots as well. I think that, that would be a very important contribution. Um, organ and very importantly, help organize to change what gets in the way. We need to change the grammar of schooling and that will require massive change culturally in classrooms but also across entire systems um, organizing to change what gets in the way maybe another important contribution another way to engage with the global south and leading practitioner and finally 
disseminate the science of learning and development in ways that are consistent with the findings of the science of learning and development, not through lectures and conventional uh, teaching, but through uh, learning partnerships with uh, those you engage with. This is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. And I really look forward to the continued conversation on this very important, um, very important field. Thank you.